Good evening. Ready to go, James? All right. Let's get this evening going. Hi. Welcome. That's great. Well, I can tell this is going to be a great evening. Uh, some of the sessions that we have here, I encourage people to talk among themselves. And you're talking among yourselves. That's, that's a very good sign. And this is going to be an extraordinary evening. And if I had to choose a theme for it, and I have, it would be transitions. And not just the city in transition, not even just the topic of our choice tonight, talking about this choice we will be making around a new director of planning, but this is also a transition for the city program. Now, I've been at this for 10 years, and I could have retired a couple of years ago. But why would I? This has been a dream job. I'm amazed they pay me for it. Uh, and it has been remarkable to have built on the foundation that the first director, Judy Overlander, provided. A solid reputation, great programs that we've been able to build on. But circumstance and opportunity make this just the right time to begin the transition to a new director for the city program. And we've started that. Our Dean Pro Tem, Joanne Curry, and I have been talking with people in the community and among ourselves within Simon Fraser. And we realized this would be a great chance to build on the foundations that have been laid for the city program. And, and as we move towards the choice of a new director, uh, for me to take a step back and, and for this interim period to have, well, an acting director. And we've made that choice. So it's a remarkable pleasure, I have to say, to introduce you to an acting director that I'll be able to work with as we move the city program to a new level. So won't you join me in, in welcoming the new acting director for the city program, Andy Ann. That was a pretty warm round of applause, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, that also tells me that a lot of you know Andy, and I'm sure many of you do because, well, you read the newspapers or you listen to the media, and you know that the remarkable work that Andy has done as the chief researcher for Bing Tom and Associates, BTA Works. But, uh, and look, he's got a, a resume here that's longer than most of the speakers that we've had here at the city program. I'm not going to go into it. Andy will have that chance, and you'll get to know him. Uh, but as an urban planner and a, a guy from SFU, and UCLA, and his own firm, and, and many places that he's worked in North America and around the world. He just has a, a, a remarkable ability to bridge this needed gap between the technology and analysis and explaining it in a way that is meaningful to people. And, and we think the city program, in the time that he'll have, will be able to to immensely move forward just in that area, both as far as the public programs that we do and and, of course, opportunities like this. Andy, come on up. Thank you. Want to say anything? Um, well, hi. Um, I'm Andy Yan, and I'll be the acting director of the city program. But I think, first of all, I think the most... One of the key things I want to start out is this incredible beacon that Judy Oberlander and our Gordon Price has built in, in the last decade, in the last two decades, for being a beacon towards what good urbanism could be or should be. And I'd like to just give a round of applause to, to Gordon Price. And, and, Judy, and, of course, Judy Ober, and, of course, Judy Oberlander. Sure. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Haven't left yet. I'll give you, give you another chance to do that. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andy. Working forward, looking forward to working with you. Well, back to transitions. And what a remarkable panel we've got, as someone said, not very often. Well, in fact, never have we been able to bring together these past planners to discuss the city's future. 
And that's all I got to say. I'm not going to give you separate bios. Many of you already know these people. But the only thing you really need to know is that they have been leading this city as directors of planning now for half a century. That's a, a remarkable achievement by any stretch, a city like this, and, and really the continuity that they've provided. Well, we're going to get into that. So let's start right away. We're going to give them a chance to speak for about five minutes, both on this question of what we should be looking for uh, for a new director of planning, but, but more importantly, what should the city be looking for? What is the culture of planning that we aim for? That's really the question that we have before us. And then we choose a person to try and do that. So we're going to do this in reverse chronological order. We'll begin with Brent Totterin there on the far right, and McAfee, Larry, you guys reversed on me. Darn. They were co-directors of planning and had, uh, I think you've been in the trenches uh, as, what was your role back then? Housing planner. Housing planner. I remember that very well indeed. And of course, Ray Spaxman. So let's begin with Brent. Brent, tell us. We've got two things we're looking at here. What we'd be looking for in a director of planning. But what's the culture of planning? Well, I suspect all of us are, uh, may come at this question from different perspectives. And I think I might be the only past chief planner uh, who when I was hired was the subject of an event like this. I was tr t we, Ray and I were talking about whether there had been previous, when, when you two were appointed, whether there had been a conversation about what sort of planner you should have after Tom Fletcher. Uh, and I remember following this conversation uh, from afar at the time while I was going through the hiring process and how impressed I was that there was, what it said about Vancouver as a city that you could gather a crowd and even get media attention around the question of who the chief planner should be, what kind of person the chief planner should be. Not very many cities, still in my experience, would, would consider such a conversation important enough uh, to warrant uh, this kind of crowd on a night like this. Uh, and I was impressed back then. And, but I'm going, to, I'm going to tackle this first part maybe a little differently, and I'm going to say this in the context of some concern to, is I'm, I apologize if I'm raising your, your blood pressure right off the bat. <laughs> But I've got, I've got concerns about uh, the moment that we're in that go well beyond this particular HR question of who the next chief planner should be. Because when I was hired, I remember feeling like the, the, the public felt that, boy, if we could just hire a, another good chief planner, everything will be all right. That was the kind of feeling that I was picking up. I don't feel that way anymore. Uh, I look at the context of Metro Vancouver as a region and I see planning stripped out of TransLink for austerity purposes as, as we've all bought into this narrative that we should cut, gut the, 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 the operating budget of TransLink and now there's been two rounds of cuts where basically all the planners are gone from TransLink. I can no longer name who the, uh, the strong uh, vocal voice at the region is for planning, the sort of new Ken Cameron. Uh, at the regional level. I, I'm lucky enough to work across the region now and I know that there are many chief planners across all the municipalities of the lower region who are doing very good work in very challenging circumstances with different political positioning, uh, often doing work quietly because their councils would rather their chief planner be seen and not heard. But they're getting uh, good and, and creative work done. That gives me some hope. But uh, a lot of the the city making and the region making that seems to be going on right now in the region is being done by provincial ministers, it seems, or, or by the premier. When you, when you look at impacts of issues like the transit referendum or decisions that are being made right now about the future of the ALR that are fundamentally affecting the nature and f future of our region, not just our city, uh, it, I think it's a legitimate question to ask about whether we still care about strong, smart planning in this region, whether it's still part of our identity, uh, certainly in the way that it felt like it was part of the identity when I first came here almost 10 years ago. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite nervous about that. And when I think about the HR question at City Hall, I, I wonder, do they even want a chief planner who's going to be the kind of chief planner that we all aspired to be? Uh, principled, provocative, outspoken, not shy. None of us uh, on this panel are shy about uh, saying uh, what we feel needs to be said, speaking truth to power, so to speak. Uh, but I'm not sure that's what the powers that be at City Hall want anymore. And uh, if it doesn't matter um, um, how uh, impressive a position is on paper, if all the good planners out there 
read the situation and think, well, I can't be a passionate and outspoken city maker who, who, who is in, extremely passionate about the future of our region if, if the political masters and such won't let me be that. I, I think it's, the jury's still out on, on what the new city hall will be. They're hiring not only a new chief planner, but a new city manager and several other leadership positions. So uh, if I were a, a planner now looking at this job in the way that I looked at it 10 years ago, I don't know what I would think about whether or not I would want to come and whether or not uh, this is a good moment to be a chief planner in Vancouver right now. So all of those, and I, I, I'm, a, I'm an inherently optimistic person, so I don't say any of that to depress you. I say it because it's a challenge for all of us to, to, to think that this isn't just a matter of, boy, we just need to hire the right person this time again. I think we need to look fundamentally at the nature of the kinds of messages we're sending uh, as, a, as a city and as a region about whether planning and design still matter. Uh, just, uh, when I first started the job in 2007, I was speaking uh, at an event in another city, and at the end of it, in the Q&A, someone put up their hand, and, and the first question they asked was, how do we get a planner like you in our city? And I don't think they meant because I was particularly intelligent or had said anything, but I was passionate. I cared, and I was talking about the city. And my response to them was, well, if you need to ask yourself and the city needs to ask itself, do they want a planner like me? Because many city halls out there want their planners to be quiet, want their planners to go along with the political will, to play the game of credit and blame uh, instead of being politically independent. And I think our Vancouver City Hall has to ask, has to ask themselves that question now, what kind of planner do we want? <laughs> well, I'm asking the question, which is somewhat like Brent, do all good things need to come to an end? Now, I'm not negative, and my answer actually is no, they don't need to come to an end. Gord asked us to talk a bit about vision and how that linked to the new, and that's vision with a small b, <laughs> and how that linked to the new planning director, or should I say general manager of planning and development services, quite a different thing. Just for a moment of background, if you all recall, and most of you will recall, in, what was it, 1976, the first World Urban Forum was here. And I remember people saying, hmm, oh, Vancouver a kind of unspectacular city in a spectacular setting. Now, 30 years later, in 2006, the World Urban Forum was back here, and people were holding Vancouver up as a showcase for new types of urban innovation. A vibrant inner city with families, financing growth, public engagement, and the question then was, came up, actually, at that, just after that time, what else is there to do? Well, there's a lot of outstanding initiatives. Certainly, we had city plan, and while I think a lot of the directions are still relevant, the community identified 19 neighborhood centers, and the whole process has stalled. Only two centers actually went through rezoning, and I'm not sure that any are now underway. While we are internationally recognized for public engagement, I've had visitors come recently and say, but this looks like same old, same old, what people did elsewhere. The planners do the plans and the public responds and say, where did this plan come from? And there's the question of research, which is seldom raised because most of these folks are more interested in doing and designing than researching. My side was more the research side. But I think it's often forgotten that most of the policies we came up with had a very good intellectual foundation. You think about housing families at high density, which brought children into the downtown. That wasn't just haphazard, a lot of research including people like Penny going out and interviewing people who were living in family housing at the time, what works and what doesn't. It stood the test of time. When we did DCLs, 
and CACs, we had to balance community needs with market viability. A lot of fiscal impact analysis happened. I don't see a lot of that happening now. And I'm hoping that when a new planner comes in, and with a new government who may restore the long-form census, that <laughs> indeed there will be some analysis of the kind of needs that are happening in the city as so many of the baby boomers age and more people come to the community and resources continue to be very tight. So I think there's a lot of work to be done to set sort of new directions, new ways of doing things. I'd like to also comment on this new position or the position that's being advertised. It's a general manager for planning and development services. Now, this is quite different from what Larry and I were. We weren't a general manager. General manager means that you sit at the corporate management table. Now, that sounds pretty good, excepting I sat there covering for Jackie Forbes Roberts for six months. And the amount of time spent worrying about the latest service improvement fad and next year's budget cuts meant that planning didn't get done. So I'm concerned about the general manager having time taken away from planning. Then there's the question of development services. We were lucky that the building, chief building official, the building department, a lot of development services actually happened in other departments. Now, and I believe the there's about 300 people in the planning department, about double what we had. And the amount of management it takes for a larger and a more diverse set of responsibilities. And that brings us to planning. And I would echo what Brent said, but I would notice that while we were in the planning department, the really interesting council priorities we're by and large being led by planning, or planning as co-managing with engineering or finance. Today, those exciting projects, what I call the fun projects, are being managed out of the city manager's office. Housing, housing projects, the Green City Initiative, a lot of the intergovernment relations, where planning might have written in the past things like the New Deal for Cities document for Vancouver. Now that's all happening in the city manager's office. So there is a question about what the planning department has left on its plate that council's interested in. Now I've been listening to some of the previous discussions around this topic, and there's a lot of interest in a new city plan or some new initiative around that notion. For those calling for a new plan, let me finish with my experience. When in the late 1980s, the planning department thought we needed a new plan, and council had no interest in it at all, we tabled the Vancouver plan, and it still sits on a shelf. A few years later, when council was coping with NIMBY, and they wanted to hear from the community, suddenly, Planning ramped up, and over a few years, some 100,000 people, under the inspiration of council and with planning managing the process, started talking about the future of Vancouver. Now, you may be calling for a new plan, but if that's not council's priority, I would suggest the challenge is to look at uh, how you adjust council priorities and not bash the director of planning for not delivering. I would say timing is everything. And if council's willing to tackle some of these issues, then let's hope the new planner is there and ready to roll. But I think most importantly, let's hope that all of those new initiatives aren't short-term projects in the city manager's office and are really part of a broader ongoing city initiative. So, I don't think good things need to end, but I certainly think the new planner needs to learn about Vancouver and some of the directions, some that work, some that need to be changed. Listen 
particularly to the community who's very knowledgeable, and then lead in some of the new directions that will try and make sure Vancouver stays one of the most livable and sustainable cities in the world. Thanks, Anne. Larry, the other co-director. Well, I'd like to uh, start by noticing that there were two other events before this event, and I was very happy to see those events because those were events that involved young people, that involved the public, to start talking about the planning issues of the day. And if you haven't seen some of the material that came out of there, I commend you to go on whatever website you do go on and to look at that because I think it should be uh, in informative for anyone that has to uh, deal with the questions that we're dealing with tonight because it's uh, advice that comes from people who are really the, uh, the recipients of the services uh, of planning. I'm a little different than my colleagues who have spoken before. I believe profoundly that the planning that a city does is determined in large measure by the audacity and the aggressiveness and the intelligence of the planners who do the planning. One thing about being a has-been in one city is you make your living in every other city. <laughs> and I can tell you, there are innovative, amazing, aggressive planners at work in cities all over the world. People who started when the planning was at a bottom ebb, a terrible ebb. Uh, in Auckland, New Zealand, an extraordinary planning team at work. In Toronto, Jen Kismet who went from a time where really planning was just right on the edge of things and has brought that back to the center. And so I believe that the chief planner, but also the entire planning organization, because no planner does this job. It's done by hundreds of smart, intelligent people. Rhonda Howard's in this audience. Rhonda Howard should be the director of planning. <laughs> Because she was the director of planning on many issues that we dealt with. Because we worked as, a, as a, a team of intelligent people. But what the leader has to be is a person that inspires. A person that goes out and fights for that planning. A person who establishes it, that it's necessary. Not wait for some politician to tell you they want it. They're never going to tell you they want it. You have, to have, you have to go and convince them it's the right thing. And so for me, of all the things that could happen, you could be a good administrator and all that. I'm not, I don't care about that. I expect that. But I want a planner in this town who has a vision for this place, that has a vision for great cities, that knows what good cities are about, that knows when it doesn't work, and that will push that forward and will inspire all of those planners in that organization that she or he runs and leads to do the best possible work they can do. We haven't, in my opinion, had proactive planning in this city in the last few years. We are still dealing with plans that are obsolete. And every single day, they become more obsolete. The reason we have affordability problems is that we are 10 years behind planning the city to address the need of the supply of housing, among other things, and the new methods that we need to bring to affordable housing. These are things that are not being done in the city, and they need to be done, and they will be done by an innovative, forward-thinking, visionary planner. So for me, that's the first important thing that has to happen. Second, that planner has to be a great communicator. That planner has to be a person that when they stand up, you stop talking and listen, not because someone told you to, but because you want to, because you believe in what that person's going to say, because you know you're going to learn something from what that person says, and you know that person's going to shut their mouth and listen to you as well. And I want a planner who's a good communicator, and finally, I want that planner to have a hell of a lot of passion in what they believe in, so they don't stand up for it when a politician starts uh, saying, well, we don't do this or we don't do that. In fact, they stand up and say, you need to do something. And they build a huge constituency of thousands of people behind them to do whatever needs to be done so that when they walk up to council and talk, they know, that council knows they're speaking for hundreds or tens of thousands of people. The second is you have to remember that this planner in this organization is also leading one of the most transactional development management processes in the world today. 
We, we decide what people can do according to a negotiation, a discussion. And you know what? It's proven to be one of the most effective systems in the world. Except that, in the last few years, we've forgotten how to use it. We don't take advantage of the benefits of it. People have forgotten the basic intentions of it. So the planner has to be a great negotiator. They have to be a great political actor. They have to be a person that has a natural gravitas that brings with it a sense of truth in what they're saying and a sense of pulling people together and getting things done and being able to negotiate with those powerful people out there that would prefer to control the city rather than have you control the city or the planners who represent you control the city. So those are things that, bottom line for me, have to come back to the planner in this town. You can't have a planner in this town when no one knows who the hell the person is. You can't have a planner in this town when someone writes in the newspaper, well, you know, Vancouver's not as good as Toronto and the people are not as smart as Toronto. You've got to have a planner in this town who believes in this town, who believes in these people. And then it brings me then to the planning culture that that planner has to sponsor with all their colleagues. You know, I now know, and I can tell you from my experience all over the world, we have a great planning culture. We have a great technical skills. We have great insights. We have great principles. But what we have lost in the last few years is demolishing all of that. We have forgot about how to talk to our citizens. We don't know how to do public engagement anymore. I, it frightens me. When I'm invited as an old has-been codger from the past over to a neighborhood because no one in the planning department or the director of planning will come and talk to them. No one will tell them what it, what, how the process might work. No one will listen to them. And then you have processes where everything happens and everyone dance, dances around and then the planners decide to do something else. We have to bring back a commitment to real public engagement in the planning of this city, and we have to let the city be the result of that public engagement, not just a little bit of window dressing on the side, which I think it has become. And if, in fact, you, we can bring back that involvement and all those tens of thousands of citizens into this discussion about the city of the future, you can have faith that it will be a great city. And then your planner becomes the agent for that. And that's what I'm looking for in the next regime of planning here in Vancouver. Thank you. Ray Spaxman. Well, the old codger on my right, as he announced himself, is uh, quite young, actually. Yeah. Right <laughs> Ray's our father. <laughs> So that's, that's actually fascinating because when you're the fourth, one, two, yeah, I still count, the fourth speaker, all the stuff that you thought you might want to say is perhaps not as relevant as you thought it might be because what they've raised your ire, I can tell from the level of support. The enthusiasm of, well, half your faces anyway, that you're enjoying this debate that's starting here and will eventually go out to you and you can enjoy them and tell us where we've gone wrong. One fascinating thing is that if this represents from uh, 1973 through to 19... 2012. It's interesting to see the different characters sitting here who all played a part as a director of planning. And we're all so different. And we were all relatively successful, made lots of mistakes and screwed up and were human. And one of the things about the new director of planning, going to be he or she, is it's going to be human. And if, if she or he is human, she's going to have a difficult time of raising to the standard of a man on a charger with a flag driving everybody in that direction. So there's a subtlety about that relationship that that human being has to have, recognizing their own strengths and their own weaknesses, and gathering around them the experts. And the experts are interesting because most of the experts in the city are the people who live in the city an experience. Uh, when I was an area planner in Toronto, I learned very quickly that it was the little old ladies, as we call them in Rummitude, I guess, who came into the office who had the wisdom about how that place worked. 
not the incoming planner from, in my case, from England with a strange accent, trying to tell them how to be planning. And that was a great learning period of time when I first formed the thought that it was the people that mattered. And every organization and every part of any organization that denies that is harming the place. And I agree with some of my speakers that that's been harmed. In recent years, and it's, it's prevailing the whole of every government, perhaps the latest election gives hope that there's enough people that won't stand for it. So you've got to open your window and shout out that you've had enough. There's more and more people who do that will then perhaps be able to control who's going to make this decision. How are they going to make the decision? Is it going to be a popular decision? Is it a decision that can take? Who is the next director of planning? And the next director of planning, um, if he comes in too strong, or she comes in too strong, with this council, um, there could be some difficulty because you know who leads planning at the present time. Now, unfortunately for us, the Vision Council has some very good principles, you know, the sustainability of the green city, the ways of doing so, are so important. They need to be supported and encouraged, or just supported if you're the servant there, in what they're doing, but they need to be guided. Somehow, um, delicately, <coughs> carefully, we have to deal with them with as much as respect as we have for all you people. We have to deal with them with the same respect as you have to deal with them with the same respect. So that same respect means kindness and love. <laughs> and one big element is truth. <coughs> and truth is a major element of this. If the next director of planning doesn't want to tell the truth, or is afraid to tell the truth, they are no use to us. So even if they last six months and have told the truth, they will have a better impact than somebody who lasts, like I did, 15 years. Now, was I not telling the truth? <laughs> <laughs> or was it more subtle than that? There was something subtle going on, because I was accused all the time of being extremely naive. I'm a very naive guy. I'm still naive, as you can tell. But the, the interesting thing is that so it's truth and love and care. And how do you interview people for that? You can interview them about what your urban design skills are, uh, do you know about homelessness, uh, what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, we want them to have that. If they're going to be at the plan, first of all, they're going to have to have a planning degree. And they're not easily earned these days. And most educational systems, Penny, are pretty good in bringing people the idea that ethics is important as well as statistics. And so how you get that balance is what we hope a wise council will look for. Now, council, fortunately, doesn't just have to make a director of planning. They have to make a city manager too, because they fired the city manager, or they said they did, or somebody said they did. And anyway, the city manager's gone, the director of planning's gone, and they have an opportunity now to do something very profound, and that is bring a planner in who's a planner. Now, there's a whole lot of discussion here about management. I should probably leave management to another session, but I also like that one that Covey says, that the important thing uh, when you're in a position like this is to lean the ladder on the right, right, right wall. That's leadership. The person who gets you to the top of the ladder and then describes and finds that it's not the right place may be a good manager. Pick the leader in this. And that leader has to have the combination of leadership skills, human skills, communication skills, and an ability to handle a council, which is very tricky business, but is changing. I think uh, federal, provincial, regional, city, uh, politi political systems are changing. The people have had enough. They're feeling it. I think the last election proves there's a, a wind of change. And we can catch that wind. And maybe this council has enough subtlety about its understanding of human beings and what goes on to recognize they need to shift in order to represent the population properly. I'm also conscious that I've sat in this audience many times. And I've got to tell you, I get very uneasy when one person, two person, three person, four person have gone on with their own opinion uh, for at least five minutes each. And I'm thinking, that's enough. That's really, I'm glad I came. I've enjoyed it. But can, can we have our turn, please? And if we believe what I believe, that there's a lot of people in here with a lot of empathy for what we're saying collectively. Although, if we had the debate, you'd find a lot of disagreement here this evening. 
And one of the things I enjoyed so much about being the director was my staff disagreed. They disagreed with me, and we had debates about that. And they uh, tackled me on the fact that I was wrong. And that was enjoyable, because it meant, as they say, you know, if three, <laughs> if three people agree, uh, you don't need to have a discussion. So when, you, when you've had a disagreement, or you have another point of view, then it's good to have it. So I hadn't said what was in here yet, and uh, Gordon's saying that I can't go on for another half an hour. And so I'm going to stop now and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Good work. Good work. Thank you, sir. <laughs> but you can get away with it. You don't work at City Hall. I, what I heard was that you were saying that in order to get the kind of planner that we need, the political culture, the council that runs this place has to change. It's culture. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Uh, it, it has to, I, it has I, to understand I, I, better. I actually no. don't agree with no. that. Okay. No. 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 Um, what I've been trying to say is that the planner is the sponsor of a way of looking at the world. The planner is an agent to tell people, to show people, to illustrate through example that you can build a city in a different way, in a better way, to offer a different thing than people start with. I have to tell you that all over North America, I see planners who are, they're modest, they're, they never want to be seen in public, they never want to tell the story, they never want to do anything that's, you know, that would endanger them. And that's why I keep saying that c courage is a really big part of this thing. And you, if you take the, take the experience recently, of, I, I'll go back to Jennifer Kismet, the new director of planning in Toronto. Her council doesn't agree with her on a lot of things. Her council would rather her that she's not doing her job. But she keeps doing it. She keeps building constituency for it. She keeps building political interest in it. She finds her alliances. And slowly, she's bringing planning back from a very low level in Toronto, one of the lowest in this country, to being a meaningful guiding force for that city. And to me, that's what the planner does. You know, it's pretty easy if everything's good and you come in and, you know, everyone's happy and the politicians love you and all that. Well, that's, that's the easy planning. The harder planning is to go to a place where people maybe don't get that yet. And you can start to show that through the quality of what you have to say and what, how, whether you can be convincing or not. And I think we need much more strength and courage in our planners than we've seen recently. Hello, uh, Brent. Ray and um, I'm, I think I'm the only one here who actually has worked uh, directly with and for the, the Vision Council. And what I'll say is that the, the problem statement was that in my observation when they came in, they had heard the narrative that said, uh, you have a lot of good ideas. Staff is going to try to keep the, the, you from achieving them. Uh, that was the shtick, that was the narrative that existed at City Hall that Judy Rogers somehow kept council from doing what it wanted to do. And I think the new Vision Council, I'm being really candid with you here, I think the new Vision Council heard that and said, well, that's not how it's going to be with us. Uh, and I, look, I greatly lament that because as, as Ray said, um, when they came in, the vast majority of what they were saying, we planners were downright excited about. Uh, there were a lot of things that were, were exactly in keeping with kind of our own perspectives on city making. But immediately something was obviously different in how you do things. And it was a sort of a, if you're not with us all the time, 100% uh, of the time, uh, you're against us. And so uh, if you even disagreed once or twice in a, in, a, in a series of 10 conversations, that could come back to haunt you. Now, as I, I would frequently go to my former... Uh, uh, my predecessors and ask for advice on how to deal with them and they were all very helpful and as Larry said that doesn't stop you from saying the right thing you still say it you still do it you still act on principle and you and you and you do your job speak truth to power and you never uh, are so afraid to keep your job that you don't do your job but I, I don't really think it was a problem of the culture of the politicians because everything I've just described was lamentable because we were actually on their side but they didn't necessarily always see it that way. The real problem is when, I'm going to be candid again, when they hired a city manager 
who was the real uh, author of an entirely different culture at City Hall. And it was the city manager that created a culture of don't uh, disagree or else you will pay the price. Keep your head down. There's only one smart person in the room and it's not you. <laughs> Uh, and that culture, it was the culture from the city manager's office that was the real problem. Okay. Now, you can say that Vision hired her, but I still think that that's the root of it. So that's why I'm optimistic, because that city manager is gone. And uh, there is an opportunity now for this Vision Council, who's been in place for a fair while, to realize that staff are really on their side. And nobody's trying to keep them from uh, being the political leaders they want to be. But we're a team. Okay. Staff and council are a team. Right. Yeah, I don't, uh, uh, politicians are people too, and uh, they have the frailties and the necessity to get on with their work, and they're nice people mostly. I mean, who else would volunteer to stand to do a, a difficult job like that and then carry on as they do? So I have a lot of wish to help the politicians. You may not think that from some of my writing, uh, but I'm critical. But nevertheless, they had a difficulty when they appointed Penny, and that was... Um, Olympic Village and other things were in real crisis form and they needed a strong manager and uh, the mayor had uh, recognized the strength of the previous deputy minister to get things done and that was brought in and Penny did that and some people believe that was a bit of a miracle, I don't know for sure, and did the job but then she waved her fingers at everybody because she was the only one who knew anything right. And I've been to several meetings, which Brent's been at when I've been at meetings where there's three of me and the rest are three people from downtown east side. And I don't think it's just telling secrets. And she and I would be having a row. Brent would try to find a midway. He'd be told to shut up because it wasn't council's policy. And so that, what that did is denigrate the whole of the staff. That had gone. Maybe uh, Vision knows that now. They know that they have to reach back to all us people in the city and do a better job. And the opportunity to get the manager and the director of planning at the same time is a wonderful opportunity for that to be remedied. It won't hurt their policy direction. It'll help their policy direction because more and more people get behind it and be able to refine it. Just like, and I see Marguerite sitting there, just like Team knew in, way back in 1972. One of the things that I keep wondering about as I go around and I listen, I've tried to stay out of things because I've been mostly working elsewhere in the world. And as I go to the odd thing in Vancouver, I sense this sort of something's wrong and that somehow the public and the council are on totally different wavelengths. Now the strange thing is when I look at the sort of 10 or so directions that teams set back in the 1970s, this council is still moving in those directions. They're worried about affordable housing. They're concerned that um, the city be not only sustainable, but as the new knowledge has come, greener. They're trying to ensure that this is a walking, biking, transit city. They're making sure that growth pays its way for new community services. These aren't new directions. They're really directions that have come over many years. But what seems to be the case is that I don't think council realizes that they're not new directions, that they're really building on the past. They're sort of institutional amnesia and that might be, as an aside, because while well, we sort of alluded to the staff that were around us, we never really said much about it. And I brought two exhibits here for you, which you can't see, but we'll put in the material. <laughs> One is under Ray's direction, there were a number of bright young planners. Now, by the time if you don't recognize them. That's Rhonda. There's Rhonda. <laughs> there's Trish French. There's Larry. There's me. There's Roy with brown hair. Now, the interesting thing is that Larry and I, when we had to put a management team together, 
this was our management team. We'd all been around since the 1970s. We all had a good understanding of the directions of the city. But within a year or two, and we'll add this as Exhibit B under you know, the materials from this workshop, within a couple of years, mostly because a lot of us aged, but also some people found more creative or interesting different jobs, the vast majority of people, I counted somewhere around 60, of the people who had written the policies and plans over the previous 30 years, I mean, I see some up here, Frank's here, many people, had left the city. So the irony is that while you've had a council that has been following directions that have been around for 30, 40 years, almost half a century, the people who might be able to help and explain to the council and build on that left the city. So I could see the challenges that Brent faced as many people left. But that doesn't mean there aren't new, young, capable people and a very educated population in Vancouver who I sense are all willing to engage and help. And hopefully there'll be a more open um, door at City Hall for that. And some of those policies can be continued but improved with everybody engaged in them. But we did have a loss, and I think that that's been part of the challenge that the more recent planning directors have had to cope with. I just wanted to say that I, I'm afraid I think it's a little too simple to say that the, the issue that we have with planning right now has to do with the city manager or the nature of that city manager. I might have things to say about that city manager or I might not, but I don't, th I don't think it's that simple. I think it has to do with a combination of things. But what I'm trying to say for this particular topic is one of the things it has to do with is the strength of the person who is leading the planning service and plan planning efforts of the city. Whether that person really commands around them hundreds of hundreds of people and other people to building a real movement that, that really any politician would have to respond to. And also whether that person is courageous. I learned something from Ray, which I tried to carry on, and I know Anne tried to carry on, and Britt carried on too. And that was, you have to be courageous. You can't just, when someone says, uh, 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 you can't just shut up. You have to still say what you think is right. And when they don't want you, they don't want you. I always told, I tell everyone that when I took on this job, and Anne knows this because she did about the same thing, we organized our personal lives so that we could be fired at any point without kind of collapsing in an economic disaster. <laughs> Otherwise, we belong to them. And we didn't want to belong to them. I learned that from Ray. I watched him come convene us all years and years ago and say, I want you to know I'm probably going to be fired tomorrow morning. You did that at least three times in my memory. <laughs> and he never got fired. He, like, he retired with honor. And it's because when you are a planning leader that says things that are compelling, when you're a planning leader that says things that people believe in, when you're a planning leader that listens carefully so your voice is the voice of a bunch of people that you've heard and learned from, you become a very compelling force in a democratic political process. And that's what I feel we need to get back to, and I think we've lost. And I didn't, haven't seen that in recent times. I, I'm not laying blame on anyone. I just haven't seen it. I can tell you there are a lot of other councils and a lot of other places where I'm doing work right now that are a lot less sympathetic to planners than the planning uh, the, and, the, and the council of this city. And not only do, do the council of this city have many of the things that I think many of us believe in, but they have been, you know, pretty positive about planning and about planning activity as compared to the struggle that I know goes on in, by planners in other places. And it's important that we not forget that these are just not institutions and positions. These are people. And if the people are really good at what they do, you have success. And if they're not very good at what they do, you don't have success. You've been remarkable in articulating the clear need for the character of the kind of person. But what about the community itself? 
I think all of you, with maybe the exception of Brent, dealt with a city that had to accommodate growth, but never had to come to terms with changing the character or scale of the established neighborhoods, except on the margin. We had the mega projects because we had the industrial land. We had a neighborhood process, city plan, it's true. But look how, as you've already acknowledged, how little it was implemented. When you come up, and I learned this in politics, no one ever goes into a neighborhood and says, hi, we're here to change the character of your community. How would you like us to do that? <laughs> is the character of the community now such, with the flow of wealth that has come into this, with the desire of people to keep the character in the face of forces of gentrification, more than ever our reluctance to see a change in character or scale. And in fact, if a council can't look to planners to do that, are they not then entitled to find another way? I think there are ways of doing that. And I look at some of the recent plans, Marple, West End, Grandview Woodlands, which is still going through a planning process, which didn't work. But I look back to Knight and Kingsway, King Edward Village area. That's not on the top of all your minds for neighborhood change because it wasn't a fight in the neighborhood. The community sat down with architects, developers. They looked at their own needs and how they were aging and changing. They looked at the services they wanted, new libraries, a grocery store, a variety of different community services, and they worked together to say, if we have change, how are we going to make that benefit the community? And I still remember one February night when there was a public hearing. I don't know whether you had left council at that time or not, Gord. And we came with the plan, the community came with the plan for Knight and Kingsway. No, it, was, uh, yes. it was after you. Yes. And 80 people showed up. And we said, holy shit. I mean, that's a significant planning term. <laughs> uh, technical term. Technical term. <laughs> what did we do wrong? We thought the community supported this. Well, the mayor said, you know, anyone want to speak? And two people got up and spoke, and they spoke in favor of the plan. And then, anyone want to speak? Anyone want to speak? Anyone else want to speak? Council approved the plan. And immediately at that moment, the 80 people jumped up. They started throwing confetti and balloons and cheering the fact that their plan got approved. Now, go drive past Knight and Kingsway and look at the scale of that development and realize that 1,500 single family, single family in quotation mark, homes in that neighborhood were actually also rezoned to a variety of infill forms. The community can work for itself to see change, and they got out of it a new library, a new grocery store, some new parks, and um, community center improvements. So I think it can work. It's just the way it's done. Well, I, I, I'll extend what Anne is saying. I found something that served me pretty well in almost any setting, and I too started, as you know, as a neighborhood planner. And, and I found that, that if I go and talk to any group of people in this city, and I really find a way to put the real issues on the table, and I find a way to let them cope with those issues and learn about it and learn what the possibilities were and what the implications were, I got good results. I found a kind of a wisdom in that, that collective wisdom that's always served me well. We think we're coping with a lot of change. But you know what? You've got to look at Bogota, or you've got to look at Curitiba. And their leaders, who were faced with people who were afraid as well as angry, were found a way to reach out to those people and say, together, let's figure out how to cope. Because you know what? We can't go anywhere else. This is our home. This is the only thing we have. It's very little, but it is the only thing. And that means a kind of a collaboration, a partnership uh, with the people of your city. I still think that works. Yeah, I, I, th I think it works. And, and, and I have no evidence here that it doesn't work. But what I think doesn't work 
is when you go out and talk to people and then you develop, they all develop a plan and it goes back to City Hall and someone at City Hall says, no, it's not good enough. Yeah, rewrite it. And we'll just do whatever we want to. Then people feel upset, angry. They feel abused. Is it possible to get a comprehensive, complete city plan that is what's been called for by many uh, that will deal with change on the scale that's required to accommodate the next several hundred thousand? One city plan through a single process? Can I, can I start up? Because I, I, I'm conscious too that this director of planning is going to have to get on well with the region. And that's because primary in, in primary impact on this city is going to come at a much higher level than the city's concerns. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get in harmony with the metro planning organization, and if that doesn't get itself organized too, we shall be facing disasters from globalization, economic, environmental, and social changes that are far bigger than just homelessness or just converting the residential area. And we have to enjoin that discussion at that level with the whole community. Because unless the whole community can get involved with the issues that we are facing, like we read the newspaper and they tell us we can have another million, for sure, in 30 years. And another, another a million after that, a million after that, a million after that. And you know where that goes to. It can't go. It's already at 7 billion in the world beyond our capacity to equally share the benefits of what nature provides. And it's going to get worse, it's serious, and so the next structure planning and the plan for the city has to be done very much in conjunction with at least the region and hopefully the province and hopefully the feds. Other examples in other communities show that the federal governments often are much more involved right. in what's happening in their cities. But do you think it is possible to extrapolate that million down to the neighborhood level in a single process to produce a comprehensive plan that can accommodate that growth in the time frame that you're talking about. Yes. I think, yes, and I think Correct. what you're talking about in a short time frame is a land use plan. A comprehensive plan has to also include services, tough choices around money and funding, and it has to include. We need, we need to have a bigger yep. debate on this, yep. I think. Well, because let me we have the debate. Work right it out. I don't hear any of you putting forward a process that suggests there will actually be tough decisions. What I hear you saying is that you work in conjunction with the community through a process that listens and accommodates, you will get the result that everyone will be satisfied with. I can tell you as a politician, X, I don't believe that. Well, I put up my hand a couple of times. Um, <laughs> your, your, your introductory statement certainly wasn't true in my case. Um, yeah. The narrative when I was hired was the downtown is basically done, which I found a hilarious statement since I spent a fair amount of my time still working in the downtown. But that the rest, that the, it was the challenge of the rest of the city because the quote unquote easy parts were done was the narrative when I was hired, whether it's true or not. Uh, two months before I was hired, the mayor uh, at the World Urban Forum announced this word eco density with no sense of what it meant. And my first task was to figure out what it meant um, and turn it into something workable. And, and he wanted it uh, done in four months which means no time for public engagement. Now, we ended up taking two years on it. And I think it was, ended up being a better conversation uh, than, than many people still give it credit for. But we spent most of our time digging ourselves out from the problems that, of how it was la la launched. And the sort of feeling, which to a certain extent was true, that the mayor who launched it really thought towers were the bee's knees and should exist just about everywhere. So how do you have a conversation about change in the rest of the city when, when it's the, the narrative was the fear of the Manhattanization of the neighborhoods uh, and the so-called suburbs of Vancouver? So at the end of it, we ended up developing words like gentle density and hidden density, laneway housing, all these kinds of things to talk about how, you, how neighborhoods can change but not fundamentally uh, eradicate their existing character in a reasonably healthy way. But my observation, even once having that high-level discussion, is that the existing plans, and, and with respect to the people who worked on them, didn't provide any clarity on how the rest of the city would change. We actually did an, uh, an, uh, an exercise where we looked at what all the community visions enabled, and we tried to map it. And it was a, it was a patchwork quilt of confusion. 
And I found when I was I'll loan you my map of it. <laughs> well, well I, we probably still have it. And that was the starting point uh, for a conversation of do we need a new plan? If for no other reason to provide clarity to everyone, including the neighborhoods, about what was possible now and what might happen in the future. I'm one of the people with the Vancouver Planning Commission who first championed the idea of a new plan. If you asked me now, I would say the city should absolutely not start a new plan because we don't have the moral authority as a planning department. We don't have the positioning with the communities and credibility. Uh, it would be a bloodbath. It would be a disaster. Uh, but I do believe a new plan is necessary, maybe once uh, credibility is being reestablished, both in terms of the principled approach to how design and growth can occur and how uh, community engagement really should be done. At that point, a new plan, I think, would be extremely valuable, but timing is everything, and I don't believe you could do it now.